Hello, Jilla. After taking a month off in December for the holidays, we are back with another episode. Similar to how scientific research needs custom-made instruments, many experiments within Jilla require customized electronic components. The electronic shop, a vital nerve center of the esteemed institute, plays a pivotal role in creating these devices and working with researchers to ensure their experimental setups have exactly what they need. It's a place where circuits and semiconductors aren't just components, but the building blocks of tomorrow's scientific discoveries. Jill's instrument shop, found on the second floor of the X-Wing, is comprised of five staff members. Its head, Kyle Thatcher, who you might recall is also the head of the instrument shop, and if you haven't listened to that episode, I highly recommend going back and listening to it. James Fungafat, Terry Brown, Yvonne Reiger, and Felix Feetmeyer. You'll meet a few of these staff members today and hear more about their work building these special electronics needed to run the world-leading institute of Jilla. You're listening to Humans of Jilla, a Jilla podcast focusing on the human narrative of the institution's researchers. I'm your host and science communicator, Kenna Hughes-Castleberry. Every month, I tell the story of a researcher or group within Jilla, showcasing the human sides behind the science. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like it on our YouTube channel or follow us on Spotify and be sure to share it with your friends and family. This episode features interviews with Jilla Electronics shop staff members James Fungafat, Yvonne Reiger, and Terry Brown, discussing the importance of electronics and their customizability within scientific research. Let's begin our story. If you walk into the electronic shop on the second floor of the X-Wing, the first thing you'll notice is the piles and piles of electronic components, equipment, and tools around the large room. Every surface seems to be covered with devices, ranging from old machine components to voltmeters and more. The electronic shop also shares the room with some of Jilla's building staff, which means that the room is always bustling as people are shuffling in and out. Each electronic staff member has their own desk, which doubles as a workbench, as they toil every day on different projects for the different laboratory groups within Jilla. The first electronic staff member we'll hear from is James Fungafat, who has been at Jilla for over 40 years, carrying a lifetime of institutional knowledge with him. Thank you, James, for for popping in today. It's so nice to see you. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Thank (laughs) you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I'm just going to dive right into these questions here. Um, So what made you first interested in electronics? Well, uh, you know, I don't know if... uh... If I was first interested in electronics, I was just always, as a kid, I think, um, very fascinated by the fact that you could connect wires or flip switches or push buttons and make things happen. Lights come on, radios tune, uh, motors turn, and you could reverse the wires and make the motors go the other way. And so I think as a little kid, I was always sort of fascinated by that, and, and on that, I think, with a little bit of nurturing, maybe, uh, became, you know, electrical engineering and then here at Jilla. That, that actually kind of segues into my next question, which is maybe, can you tell us a little bit about kind of your backstory and how you eventually ended up at Jilla? Oh, wow. So I've been at Jilla for uh, 40 years, come July. My backstory, so I grew up in Guyana, okay. South America. Wow. Used to be British Guyana when I was a kid. Okay. Uh, went to school there and went to high school there. And then, if I recall correctly, the late 70s, mm-hmm. actually mid-70s, because mm-hmm. it was bicentennial for the U.S. Ah, yeah. This is taking you way back. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> to a place I, you I probably, approve it. You probably didn't ex- even uh, no, exist No, I did not point. exist. But the <laughs> 70s and 80s are making a comeback. Yeah, so I appreciate it. So mid-70s, I came to the U.S. I had an uncle living in Oklahoma, and so I went to college there, University of Tulsa. Nice. Uh, You can look that up, as you look up Guyana as well. Yes, people are just Googling it as we speak. Well, Guyana has become quite famous because they found oil. That's right, yes. Recently, which I think, I don't know if that's a good thing. But anyway, um, so got my undergraduate degree at the University of Tulsa in in, Guyana. electrical engineering, and then made a fateful decision to come to Colorado to go to graduate school. Okay. So that's how I ended up out here. 
I don't think it was because the school was great or anything. I just, I was a young guy. I was 20. Okay. And it's like, well, I've been in Oklahoma and I'm going to try Colorado. Yeah. So came out here and started graduate school. And then I was having a good time uh, going to grad school and not really necessarily uh, enjoying the studies, but having loving Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> who, Extracurriculars. Who That's right. And ended up meeting a young lady who I liked and ended up lo loving and, and wanting to get married. And so it was, James, you have to find a job if ah, you want to get married. Yeah. And so I had a friend by the name of Davide, and he was working here at Jilla in the electronic shop. And he says, James, you should apply at the electronic shop because I am leaving. Oh. <laughs> you could take my spot. Right. So I was like, Okay. This was 1984 or so. Okay, so Jill is only about 20 years old at that point. About my age. Yeah, yeah, about yeah. your age, right? About my age. Yeah. So as things would have it, um, I I don't know how I applied, actually. I don't even know if Jill was <clears throat> very formal at that point. But I remember coming in and, and speaking to Judah Levine. Oh, yes. I think he was the fellow that sort of oversaw the shops at the time. Sure. And... Um, he asked me a couple questions regarding low pass filters or something, and I made something up. And it must, <laughs> it must have impressed him. Well, I don't know if it's impressed him, but at least uh, it was enough to him, for him to say, "Well, you know, David is quitting, and sounds like he knows you." And uh, come meet Saul. So Saul Lissauer was uh, in the shop at the time. It was just the two of us in the analog side, and I think Terry Brown was also a student at the time working. But it was a pretty small operation. Okay. Uh, but that's how I ended up here uh, in 1984, okay. I think. We're in 2024, so yeah, yeah. four years. Wow, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you have probably seen so much since then, right? Because the instrument shop's grown. Jill yes, has grown. Jill has grown. Jill has grown tremendously. Yeah. Uh, which I think is a good thing, but it's been, you know, we've gone through some growing pains, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you have, just as kind of a side note, did you have any particular project that you worked on through those 40 years that you remember really distinctly? Ooh. It's hard to pick one thing out of, you yeah. know, 40 years. I think uh, some, of, some of the things that have stood out to me are more interactions with people. And, and um, you know, it's always nice when, even if you did something that wasn't super high tech or pushing the edge of technology somehow, but people are very grateful because for them, it was almost insurmountable. I mean, maybe. Oh yeah. And so, you know, maybe you connected up a broken wire, and for them in their experiment, this was just huge, the biggest thing because they were down for a day, and yeah, James, you came by and you found a broken fuse. <laughs> you saved the day. You saved the day. I remember. Graduating from uh, college and going home and, you know, you're a freshly minted double E and, and you're, the first thing your parents or grandparents want you to do is fix something. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So the TV's on a blink and I, I walked up to it and I smacked it really hard and, you know, probably jiggled some connections that were failing and, and it, it started working. And then they went, <laughs> is that what you learned in college? <laughs> <laughs> that's what the fancy degree yeah, is for. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I, you know, I think one of the things I remember was working with uh, Jan Hall, and and he would scribble things on a napkin basically and say, "Can you do this?" And oh wow, I remember doing something, and then um, he he was able to do some research that uh, I think uh, pushed uh, the edge of some sort of technology or measurement he was working on, and. And he wrote a little note saying thank you for doing this. And I was like, wow, you know, that that's pretty cool. I, I hope you have that somewhere because obviously he's won a Nobel Prize. So that's probably something cool <laughs> to hold on to. You know, it's somewhere in a drawer somewhere in one sure. of our files, I think, on a on a on the circuit that we worked on together. Yeah. Um so yeah, that was that was nice. I think the other thing that some days when you're working hard and you're feeling unappreciated. Uh, I'll walk up to the reading room and grab a couple of theses and, and read the acknowledgments or something like that. And, and, you know, sometimes your name shows up and you're like, well, you know, at least that graduate student felt like I had uh, an impact on their work. Yeah. And so 
it's not so much the electronics, but it's helping the people accomplish their goals. I think it's been quite rewarding uh, working here at Jilla. That's wonderful. And, and that leads into my other question, which is kind of a favorite thing that you like to do within the electronic shop or maybe something that you really enjoy. Again, it's the people. It's it's super to watch them come in as uh, first year grad students, let's say, and they're fumbling around with certain things, and and it's always the same thing. It seems like over forty years, it's it's still the it same repeats problem. itself, okay, over and over again. It seems like, and uh, and you're able to help them out, find something, or answer some question, and and it's it's neat to see them progress and grow. And then, you know, five, six, seven years later, they're graduating and they're all, you know, defending their thesis. and Yeah, all grown up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, you look back and you think, wow, you know, this person came in all fresh out of college and, and started here at Jilla and now they're, uh, they're graduating. And, and it's, if you stick around long enough, you get to see lots of those events. You know, I collaborated. It's great to collaborate. I think... Um, one of the things I did was worked with Felix and Terry and on an EDM collaboration with uh, Eric Cornell's and Cindy Regal's group. And and that was nice working on things like that. It was during COVID. And so things were a little bit messed up and, and yet we're able to do some science and do some engineering and, and make things happen. So that was kind of fun. Nice. Could you maybe like describe what kind of is a typical day within the electronic shop? Like, what does that look like? A typical day. Well, and maybe there isn't a typical day. <laughs> first, first you uh, you 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 get up and you get into work, uh, and you whine about timesheets. We like to whine about timesheets. Oh no! But uh, anyway, that's off. That's <laughs> off the. It's just Monday and timesheets to do. So sure. So that's on my mind. But um, we don't whine too much because it's. It's cool to come in, you turn on your computer and, and uh, start working on projects that people want you to do. And, uh, and invariably, someone will walk in with something else. And so it's, uh, you have to be able to turn off one project and listen carefully at, to whatever their problem is at the moment. And, and then you tend to ask questions because... Uh, these folks come in and they already sort of know the answer, they think. Right. Uh, and you hate to jump to the conclusion that they have jumped to. And so you start asking questions, I think, to get them to think, if not along the lines you're thinking, at least outside of the box that they've put themselves in. I see. And and so there's a conversation that, that happens. And so that happens on a typical day. I think um, we talk to each other in the lab, the, the other engineers there, Terry and Yvonne and Felix and I, we, there's always some sort of shop banter going on. <laughs> and and hopefully it's not too distracting. I think sure. for some it is, and then you just have to get up and leave. Right. For others, it's I, hopefully it's catching up on what happened over the weekend and, and maybe in the evening. And, and, you know, you'll, What's great about having other engineers around is you can talk about the issues you're facing and the problem you're trying to solve. Right. And they may say, well, have you thought of this? Or maybe this sort of has been a problem in the past and you might think about this. Uh, or we'll overhear someone asking one of the other engineers mm -hmm. something and because we'll, we're all in one big room together. You are, yeah. And we'll say, hey, you know, by the way, you know, such and such was having this um, this issue, uh, and here's how they solved it, or here's some of the things, you know, you that might worked. want to think about. Yeah. So, yeah, typical days, you get to work on the project that you started out on for a couple hours maybe, and the rest of the time is is doing sort of other things. And maybe I just have ADHD and I get distracted. Others could probably <laughs> do better. But... uh yeah, I end up working on two or three different projects at the same time. I, I don't know if I get bored at one and I just need a break. You know, sometimes you're working on something and you're banging your head against the wall and you're like, well, I'm going to stop right. and go drill some holes in a panel. You know, walk down to the instrument shop and uh, and knock out a panel or yeah. do something like that. And it frees up your mind, I think, to allow the ideas to percolate a little bit. And, and then all of a sudden you have this eureka moment maybe and you go, oh, okay, maybe I should try that. And so, come back. 
I'd come back. That's right. I see. Yeah. So how closely do the instrument shop and the electronic shop work? Well, um, so Kyle is, right. is also our boss or the head of electronic shop as he is the instrument shop. Um, we work together on mechanical issues. Okay. Uh, or if we mess something up, we'll go down there and say, guys, I need help on this. I, uh, I started doing this and I broke something <laughs> and I, I, we need your help. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we work fairly closely with them. Yeah. Um, sometimes uh, one of their instruments will uh, will fail and yeah. they'll come up and talk to us. And so, you know, we'll we'll try to troubleshoot a display that's broken. Or I remember working on uh, one of their cleaners, you know, it's got ultrasonic cleaners and, and these kinds of things. And so we'll work together to try to get it running for them. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Nice. It's and nice to have that resource. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and work closely together yeah. and have more minds on the project. Right? Sure. Since you've been here at Jilla so long, maybe just kind of as a historical overview, how has electronics changed since you started versus where you are today? Oh, wow. Um, well, so the couple of big changes, I think, is the fact that um, things that were impossible 40 years ago you know, people would come up and say, can you do this? Uh, it's now possible. Okay. I mean, the technology has advanced to the point where uh, things that we couldn't do 40 years ago, we can do now. What's thinking about that, though, I mean, people still, fellows and scientists still come in and ask us to do things. And we said, well, we can't do that right now. And so I imagine 40 years in the future when I'm long gone, <laughs> no, uh, whoever's no. sitting here is going to say, you know, 40 years ago when James couldn't do that and he said you couldn't do that, right. we can now do that. And so that's that's a big change, I think. You know, uh, it used to be 8 bits and a megahertz was uh, wide and fast. And now it, it's, you know, a guy in his, uh, you know, sitting at home can do that easily. Right. Um the other thing I think for me anyways, it seems to have changed a lot is just the whole internet. I yeah. think when, when I started here, PCs were just starting out. Um, and uh, the internet was just being born, I think. And so all this information that, you know, you had to go digging into books and data sheets and all this stuff uh, you had to have to figure things out is now like at your fingertips. It's right there. Uh, you can just type it in and, and all of a sudden you have several pages or podcasts even, yeah. whatever, yeah. Uh, where people are talking about this stuff. And so information is just so much more easily available sure. uh, to the designer. Given that, you know, we're still plugging things into the wall and getting them <laughs> to work. And so, you know, some things have remained the same. But yeah, I would say... Uh, things that seemed impossible 40 years ago are now every day. I mean, I, I look at my cell phone and I think, wow. I know. You know, there's no such thing as a cell phone 40 years ago. Uh, and here we are with these things that we can't seem to take our face away from. No. Um, and there are many computers, right? They do yeah, so much for computers, us. Computers, yeah. I mean, it's funny because when I was high school, we used slide rules. A four-function calculator was a luxury. Right. And now yeah. Yeah. it's right there. Right. Um, could you tell me a little bit about like a recent project that you've worked on? Um, I think the most recent project, I think, so we've been doing a lot of repeats. When you do something well, uh, people want you to do it again. <laughs> that and, sounds uh, about right. Yeah. And, and you know, it's uh, it's a little bit not as exciting for us because it's like, oh, I've done this before. Yes. They want another one. Yes. And the shop's really set up to do things. We we love to work on prototypes and things that are new and different, never been done before. Right. These kinds of things. So EDM was one of those things. Okay. Uh, but, you know, the repeat projects, um, there's always room for improvement. And so, sure. you know, we've built hundreds, I think, of uh, laser diode controllers. We use these laser diodes, laser diodes and Jilla to, to trap atoms and trap molecules and and so we're good at making these controllers, I think, because they keep asking us to, to wake up. <laughs> you think because they keep bothering you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so we're repeating. And after hundreds of these things, uh, we are modernizing the, the board layouts and 
the things that are on the board, even though the basic design has remained the same. Sure. Um, and so one of the things I did recently was just uh, relay out a board uh, so that uh, components are now get smaller. And, and instead of through hole components, we're making surface mount components. Uh, and so we re relayed out a board to do that. And so it was a redo of something that's already been done. But um, that's probably one of my most recent things. And again, you get to be creative. Yeah. Uh, you get to try something a little bit different. And and so it keeps life interesting, even though it's a redo. Right, right. It's still not exactly the same. Right. Nice. And then, of course, you make mistakes because it's the first time. And and then you got to go troubleshoot why why is it not doing what you did? Because right. you were very careful to do it right, and right. yet it doesn't work. There's and something so, going on. Yeah, and, and that's... You know, that's a nice thing about working in, in our environment is that we're allowed to make mistakes and, and, and then try to fix them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, my last question for you, James, kind of a broader question, just focusing on Jilla is, mm -hmm. how has Jilla really supported your shop and your work? Um, you know, I since the very beginning, I've always felt personally very uh, appreciated and the work that we do has always seemed to be accepted and rewarded. And uh, at least it seems as if uh, the shops have always been a treasured part of, of who Jilla is. And I feel bad sometimes because there are maybe other parts of Jilla that may be as important to the whole operation of the Institute, and yet the shops have have uh, been a treasured part of who Jilla is, at least to the to the labs. Right. Uh, and so that being said, uh, you know, I think funding has always been there, although, you know, they have made noises sometimes of funding being short, but, you know, we've always been able to buy the tools we've needed, buy the software we've needed. Again, Jilla's always been good to uh, our shops yeah they seem to treasure i mean one of the things that uh, jilla does is when prospective graduate students or new scientists are coming through you know they'll walk them through the shops and you know they'll say this is one of the pieces that make our institute as special as it is and so that's a very affirming it is. Uh, to the shops. Now, hopefully they go through the administration and all the other parts of Jilla, you know, even our janitorial staff. Exactly. You know, and appreciate them as much as, as they are needed, just as much as we are. Yeah, yeah. But you are kind of the front face of that a little bit more, perhaps. You know, we <laughs> seem to be, or at least we feel that way. Sure. I don't know. I don't know if that's actually true. But, right. But they make us feel that way. Okay. Which, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> just means you have to have more practice speaking to a bunch of different people and having tours in your your office, right? Yeah, and all it's, that. it's a little messy. But, uh, <laughs> messy can be good, though. Yeah, they've put up with that, so. Yes. Okay, fine. Well, thank you so much, James, for... You're welcome. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. After interviewing James, Jilla Electronics staff member Yvonne Reiger joins me in the studio, discussing his passions for all things electronic. So thank you for, for sitting down with me. I appreciate it. So I'm going to jump into the questions here. So the first one is, what made you interested in electronics? So for me, it's a sort of a lifelong experience because as a five-year-old uh, kid, I was uh, watching the TV from the backside, actually. <laughs> and I saw the nice, uh, bright colored parts uh, and the uh, glowing uh, cotton red tube that uh, drew my attention and sort of uh, it was sort of mesmerizing for me and uh, I just hopped on the boat uh, later on uh, when my first experience with doing electronics was about eight year old when uh, there was a quiz in uh, uh, nas uh, national TV mm -hmm. uh, station and uh, they were asking something about uh, radio amateurs. And by accident, uh, I just uh, read a book uh, uh, with my mom the day before about uh, uh, Josef Murgash. Mm -hmm. And uh, I won the quiz 
and <laughs> obtained um, a small kit uh, f for a small radio wow. that a gentleman from uh, the local uh, uh, national TV station helped me building. And uh, to my surprise, it worked. So wow. That was probably my first interaction with electronics. I didn't know too much of, uh, of that uh, at, this, at the time as an eight-year-old. Later on, um, uh, when I turned 13, I came across the information that there was a local radio club uh, in the city. So um, I came there and the uh, gentleman started teaching us uh, uh, how to interpret Morse code Whoa. and how to build the shortwave radios. So that was my first interaction with the radio. And then later on, as a 15-year-old, I realized I, I need to earn some buck <laughs> as a pocket money such that I could sustain some hobbies. And so I started learning how to fix TVs because a uh, few of uh, my friends used to do that. Mm -hmm. So I just got on the boat. And then later on uh, at the high school, I'm just a... Uh, natural sciences uh, were drawing my attention. So I uh, went into a bit of programming. We had a very good teacher of mathematics and an excellent teacher of chemistry. We went uh, to several local competitions and uh, also nationwide uh, competition in chemistry. And uh, that was my first interaction with science because uh, around me very few people were aware of uh, what is science good for. Uh, when I was choosing what uh, university I would attend. I was considering uh, Faculty of Mathematics and Physics, Electrical Engineering and Chemistry. But at the time, uh, I didn't know what will be uh, the best thing that would earn me a living. So uh, at the time, I decided to do Electrical Engineering because that seemed to be like the most feasible choice. Although uh, in the long run, it might not have turned out the, to be the probably the best uh, choice but <laughs> yeah we cannot go back so in the first year <clears throat> we got an excellent teacher of physics that some of uh, his uh, sayings still keep resonating in my head and it's mostly the fact that he had sacrificed his career uh, in favor of uh, teaching and uh, passing his uh, life philosophy to st students and mostly uh, the main points were to be very modest and uh, hardworking and uh, trying to always uh, push uh, our, ourselves a little bit further. Then <clears throat> later on uh, at the university, I, I went into the field of radio electronics involving ENM, microwaves, optoelectronics, lasers and similar things. That opened me a way to uh, postdoc at NIST. Uh, uh, there I had a chance to work with uh, John Lehman, who is uh, the head of uh, Laser Radiometry Group. That was my like uh, very profound experience with, with some people who made the science work for the overall good or for good of uh, people. I saw uh, quite nice projects on uh, dualcom spectroscopy monitoring the quality of, of the air and the pollution. Some satellites orbiting Earth, for instance, like a graceful on project, monitoring the uh, local variations of gravity field that actually showed how useful the, uh, these intricate instruments can be to reveal some phenomena in, in, the, uh, in the nature that will be very difficult to capture by just ordinary means. In particular, I know that... Uh, NASA was uh, uh, sending a document to Indian government about their water column uh, beneath the, the entire country dropping suddenly very fast. So they would have to adjust their water policy. And the way how they figured this out was just uh, they realized that uh, uh, the local gravity field uh, caused by water column was uh, suddenly reduced. So that was quite impressive. And then uh, the third project that really printed in my head was a swarm of CubeSats that uh, Michelle Stevens was working on, aiming to measure the total Earth radiation budget, meaning the amount of energy from sun incident to the Earth's surface versus the, uh, the amount of uh, radiation uh, 
being uh, released to the space as a black body irradiation. And from there, they could clearly distinguish whether the earth was warming up or whether the temperature stayed or the average temperature stayed constant. So uh, that was very impressive and led to very clear conclusions. And so obviously working at NIST, it wasn't hard for you to move over to Jilla then. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about when and how you came to Jilla? Yes. So uh, I was aware of uh, Jilla shops from probably the early beginning of my stay in NIST. However, uh, before the COVID pandemic, we decided to move back to Europe for family reasons. We spent some time with family and then I got on postdoc to France, uh, where I was more involved in uh, time and frequency metrology that involves building some optical instruments, uh, a lot of experimentation in the lab, uh, a lot of very precise measurements, again, similar to NIST. But uh, it wasn't uh, sustainable for us because we were sort of isolated scientists in the French community. So just by a matter of lucky circumstances, I came across uh, this job opening in a Jilla Electronics shop and I found uh, this could be a good fit. The reason for that is what keeps me really motivated is the fact that we are not doing just a very one single repetitive task, but we are involved in many different scientific domains and we have to know a little bit from each corner and we get to learn tons of things if we are permitted to study. We are uh, practically the people who are operating the shops in Jilla, they are very hands-on and they are very analytical, such that uh, they don't only build the instruments, but they have to figure out uh, what is the instrument topology, how to calculate uh, necessary uh, quantities, and uh, it involves a lot of calculations, uh, literature study, comparative measurements, and uh, from very diverse fields, not only electronics and mechanics, but also chemistry, physics, and sometimes even bio biology. Most of the people who are running the shops, uh, they are balancing on the boundary between, uh, between science and technology, actually. So they are not, uh, unlike uh, in the corporate world, where they are typically tiny little wheel in the big Colosseum here, they are more involved. So that kind of leads into my next question. You know, do you have a favorite thing that you like about working in the electronic shop? Yes, definitely. So uh, the main reason why I like work in the electronic shop, especially at the university, is the fact that we get exposed to many different problems that uh, are challenging us to think hard to try to find a solution, try to uh, read tons of literature, try to calculate uh, a lot. We do tons of numerical simulations. And uh, so every day we have a little chance to learn something, something new and uh, become more proficient in our field. So, and eventually we may contribute to some bigger projects that, as I mentioned from the example from NIST, can lead to pushing the borders of humanity further. And this is uh, what we are constantly hoping for. Absolutely. That leads into kind of my, my final question for you, Yvonne. You know, could you tell us a little bit about a recent project that you've worked on? So um, probably the longest project that I, I've been involved was recently being published improvement of a so-called pound driver hole scheme, helping to stabilize the frequency of free running laser with respect to so-called ultra stable fabric perot cavity. So uh, I don't know how deep I should go, but <laughs> maybe just keep it at like a surface level sort of thing. <laughs> if that's okay. So uh, the this intricate method is already been like very successfully de uh, deployed in many physical experiments, but of course, there are always next milestones to run after. And it 
turns out that with uh, the cavity stabilized lasers, uh, physicists can access interesting domains of gravitational physics. And at that point, uh, they require very, very low noise, clean cavity signal. And unfortunately, since we are probing the so called cavity fabricable transmission by by very fine signal, uh, it gets affected, basically the lasers, laser light gets affected uh, along the propagation path, which causes uh, an unwanted amplitude and phase alternation of, of the laser beam. And we need to compensate for that, such that the signal we measure from the reflection from the fabric perro cavity actually carries only the information from the cavity itself and not um, adjacent optical components that introduce some alternation in amplitude and phase of the reflection. And uh, we can sort of pre-distort our, uh, our probing signal, or probing laser signal, by applying certain amplitude and phase modulations, such that we will pre-compensate these effects that add up on top of the useful cavity signal. And we developed an instrument that consists basically of two servo loops that constantly monitor the amplitude and uh, phase uh, alternations of the probing laser signal. And they pre-distort it such a way that uh, the overall signal that uh, accesses the cavity acts as a semi-ideal, uh, very symmetrical, Therefore, the signal from the cavity reflection uh, carries mostly or mainly the information on, on the cavity uh, at the uh, asymmetry caused by the tuning. I see. So it makes the labor laser more stable. This is correct. Finally, Jilla Electronics staff member Terry Brown, who has been here just as long as James Fungafat, discusses his journey of coming to Jilla. Well, thank you for, for sitting in the hot seat. Let's start with the first question, which is what made you initially interested in electronics? Yeah, I'd say I was a very mechanical kid. So it was, uh, you know, you pull this lever, this thing moves and this thing happens. But when I would turn the light switch on in the house and way over there, the light and the ceiling would come on, it was like, and I remember asking my mom about it, and she wasn't able to explain it to me, and more or less said, well, you're going to have to figure it out later. <laughs> you're on your and, own. Yeah, so that um, made me curious. And then this is kind of a funny story. Um, I I was pretty precocious. I always wanted to do things, and uh, um, I don't know how old I was. I think I was older than the light switch thing. My uh, mom allowed me to use the toaster. So I was toasting bread, and she told me if the bread gets stuck, you unplug the toaster, and then get the metal fork and pull it out. Right. So the toast got stuck. Oh, no. And I pulled out the plug, and the plug fell apart, shorted and sh shot sparks out of the wall, burned my hand, and turned it black. What? Yeah. Oh my goodness. So I, I guess. Um, <laughs> ever since then, you've been fascinated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've been making sparks ever since so... then. <laughs> no, I was horrified because my hand was black. Right. And uh, it was burned. So when I tried to wash it, it wouldn't come off because my hand was burnt and I couldn't. Why? So I was like, is my hand going to be black for the rest of my life? Oh, no. <laughs> And uh, I know I was in grade school, so second or third grade. And when I went to school the next day, everyone thought it was cool because it had lightning. Oh, nice. Marks in yeah, it. Burn and marks. then I was, yeah, then I was disappointed when it wore off. But anyways, um, so. So since then. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> kind of elaborating on that, could you tell us a little bit about your backstory of how you ended up at Jilla and, and when that all occurred? Yeah, so I grew up in Pueblo, okay. and uh, I started out as a double E going okay. to school there, and they didn't have a four-year program, so essentially I got my associate's degree 
and then came to CU Boulder to finish. But, of course, then I switched to physics and started <laughs> over. But uh, interestingly, my physics teacher at the school in Pueblo, we took a tour here. And I actually walked through Jilla and looked at all the lasers. So that was pretty cool. And, uh, and I remember I ended up in Jan Hall's lab, just all the pretty green lasers and... Uh, uh, but eventually, I ended up here, going to school and uh, working here. So, yeah, well, I was primarily just making electronics for Jan, so oh, it seemed like a logical transition. And that was after, yeah, I just gotten my undergrad degree, and uh, it was maybe a little more complicated than that because. Um, Jam was being charged the same amount as if I worked in the electronic shop. So uh, he decided, well, I should move over. And I, it was fine. Okay. Um, you enjoyed it since then. Yeah. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> You've been here with us all that time. So. Right. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> it has. Yeah. That actually kind of segues right into my next question for you, which is your favorite thing about working in the electronic shop. What do you enjoy? Yeah, um, I mean, there's there's enough money to buy the cool toys we need to uh, do this work. So uh, I would say um, it's always really nice when the math, well, when the circuit actually works the way the math says it should. Right. And often, so that testing and uh, figuring out all the little details that um, you have to eliminate to finally make the measurement that agrees to what you calculate. So there's a lot of learning in getting those two things to line up. So that that's certainly one thing. And the other thing I like interacting with students and just working with students. Uh, yeah. It certainly would uh, it uh, adds variety to my day. So, so I I would say it's a good match for what I enjoy yeah well and you i think you get to see them from when they first start to when they graduate right yeah and then they come back and there's like people that uh, were here at the like brian demarco occasionally i see him and uh i think he was debbie jen's first student and he and i worked together quite a bit in those early years yeah so you keep in touch with everyone right yeah it's well, a small community yeah, it sure is. There's always something new to learn, right? So do you have maybe a recent project you could tell us about working on or maybe one you're currently working on? Yeah, uh, a lot of it right now is just keeping the older ones going. So, sure. uh, um, But not just that. Um, I mean, I'm repairing a circuit for Weber Group right now. Yeah. Um, and it's an old design from... Uh, I mean, I did is 15 or 20 years ago, wow. and uh, I'm kind of adapting it to their system. So, you know, the systems change, but the circuit's kind of the same, and I got to make it work for that particular <laughs> you have setup. Updated a little bit. Yeah, and uh, I mean, ideally, it would get redesigned, but uh, um, that would take some time. Yeah. yeah. And you know, the other thing, it's uh, I primarily do analog, so certainly. Digital is like taken over, so usually it's uh, there's the measurement side and then the output side. Those are the two ends I take care of, and it's usually really small signals like microvolts, nanovolts, and uh, any more lately, it seems like uh, the output end is kilovolts. So oh wow, um, you know, or hundreds of volts. Sure. So you go from really small to really big. Yeah. And in, in between now, it used to be analog, but now it's more digital okay. processing. Is it trickier to work with the digital versus the analog or is it just kind of a different I think it's mindset? just different. Yeah. It's uh, quite a bit different. But it sounds like you're always doing something new. Yeah. It's nice. Yeah. And uh I mean, part of me wants to get into digital, but there's always plenty on the analog side to learn and do. And, right. And improve um, on or redesign yeah. or something, right? It, it never ends. Yes, that's true. <laughs> Which could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending right. on your work day, right? 
Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I will switch gears a little bit and maybe ask you a more broad question, which is, um, you know, you've been here forever. So right. you've seen a whole bunch of stuff. So how has the electronic shop changed since when you first arrived? Yeah, I'm wondering what James is saying. But when I <laughs> first got here and I was a Jan Hall student, there was the digital electronic shop and the analog electronic shop. And uh, I think they had clocks on the wall, of course, analog had. Right. The old analog clock, I think it may have ran backwards. Um, <laughs> the numbers were switched and the digital had like a LED digital okay. display. But I do remember that. And But uh, soon after, and I, I don't know the exact details, they combined analog and digital and we became one shop. Oh, wow. I think the the guy who ran the digital shop left. And uh, and then they just kind of combined us both. And, you know, back then, I guess there were microcontrollers. Um, but a lot of it was just discrete digital circuits. And I certainly have designed some of those. But now, you know, there's uh, computers now take care of all that and computer cards. But... Uh, Eventually, though, the digital side became computing. So we split again, and now we're electronic shop and, and computing. computing. Yeah. And that's that was before all the computing guys that are currently there. I see. Are there. Yeah. Or, you know, happened before they were here. Sure. Yeah. So I'm assuming you get a lot of kind of interplay between computing and electronics or electronics in the instrument shop, right? kind of all yeah. the kind of team on things. Well, it's kind of interesting now. Felix does more of the digital uh, side of things gotcha. in the FPGA and microcontroller. But uh, um, computing, you know, we're pretty separate. Yeah. I mean, they, they have helped Felix, like, deal with Linux and operating systems that sure. he has on his systems. But uh, for the most part, we're, well... They help us, you know, when my computer breaks, I'm talking to Eric. I might be yeah. able to fix it, but Eric is much faster and, uh, yeah. and fixes it the right way. So, right, uh, right. And that just happened last week. Oh, no. Okay. So them and uh, the instrument shop, I mean, uh, well, we make good use out of both of them. Yeah, you all help each other, right? Yeah. And then with the final instrument or product or whatever, right, for for. A research lab. Yes. And so, yeah, you end up pairing very closely together. Yes. Well, another broad question I'll ask you, Terry, is how has Jilla supported your shop? Yeah, I think uh, um, it's been pretty true. They insulate us from all the CU things. So sure. uh, we don't have much administrative work to do, which is good because... Fewer I, meetings. <laughs> yeah. We're not... Well, I'm not particularly good at it, but uh, I guess I could do it. Um, and and then just, uh, you know, if we need a tool, we can buy it. And generally, uh, we have some really old but really nice test equipment that helps us do our work. And, uh, and that's also part of our loaner. And so we loan this stuff out which is helpful for the group so uh, they don't have to own it. And I think just recently we bought a really expensive phase noise analyzer. I mean, wow. it's like um, really expensive, and it's also now uh, loaner equipment. But, Good. Uh, yeah, and that's helpful for lasers, right? Well, it um, it's, uh, measures the phase noise of electrical clocks. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's uh, pretty useful because those clocks are what the lasers get okay. referenced to and uh, yeah. and uh, our circuits that sure. rely on good clocks. Yeah, we're kind of clock people around here, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of need those tools. Yes. Well, my, my last question for you, Terry, I appreciate you telling me a bit about your story and, and your passion and everything. Um, if somebody, you know, wants to come help, like, use your skills in the electronic shop, what's something that they should keep in the back of their mind? Um, I, I would say, you know, just come in and ask and we'll 
help them the best we can. I think in general, I mean, it really depends, right? They're here to learn. So uh, if they want to just start from scratch and see where they can get to, that's fine. Or they can come in and we can give them advice on how to do it. And, and, uh, and we can also do it for them. So it's uh, um, really kind of um, what level of help they want. But often we might have a circuit board laying around that might do exactly or close enough to what they want to do. But certainly we can give them uh, pointers in how to maybe lay out their own circuits or uh, build their own circuits by hand. So, uh, you know, we're basically here to help them. So they should, shouldn't hesi hesitate to come in and talk to us. Yeah, the door is always open, right? Yes, yes, it Excellent. is. Well, thank you. I'm... You're welcome. Thank you for listening to Humans of Jilla, a Jilla podcast. Be sure to subscribe to Jilla's YouTube channel or Spotify channel for more information and to keep listening to these episodes. This episode featured Jilla Electronics shop staff members Yvonne Riger, James Fungafat, and Terry Brown. Production design, sound design, and research by Kenna Hughes Castleberry, with assistance from Jilla's Science Communication Office and Jilla's Electronics Shop. Sound and music by Pixabay and Kevin MacLeod. Jilla is a joint institute between NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and the University of Colorado Boulder. This podcast is hosted by Jilla. Any use of this podcast without Jilla's permission or credit is prohibited.